enter the state of meditation, we need to release our consciousness from its conditioned state. That is why the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali begin, now instruction in union. Union is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. Then, awareness abides in its own nature. Otherwise, it is identified with the modifications. To enter the state of meditation, we need to quiet everything that modifies our perception and our understanding. Our consciousness, in other words. When everything that modifies the consciousness becomes still, then the consciousness is released from that conditioning, and it experiences only itself. That is yoga, union, the experience of our true nature. In that experience, there is no sense of self as we think of it. Instead, there is the consciousness, which is blissfulness, happiness, joy, wisdom, intelligence, serenity, and union with the divine. If we do not achieve the removal of those conditions, then we remain identified with the modifications, and we suffer in ignorance. That is our state now. Right now, we are conditioned. We are identified with modifications. The most obvious one is the physical body. We believe that this body is our identity. We are completely identified with it. We do not realize that the body is just a shell, impermanent, temporary, illusory. We may have heard that idea, but we do not comprehend it. There are many people who believe they are practicing yoga, when in fact they are only identified with their bodies, trying to make them beautiful, fit, slim. Another modification we are very identified with is our personality, our heritage, name, appearance, taste in politics, music, food, religion, etc. Our personality is merely a mask we wear to survive in society. We mistakenly believe it is our identity. In reality, the personality is an illusion that modifies our consciousness. We are identified with modifications that we experience as emotions, thoughts, beliefs, memories, and we believe these define our identity. There are thousands upon thousands of modifications that filter our perception and our understanding. We think that they are all real, but they are not. The fundamental reality is what is trapped deep within all of those modifications, the consciousness itself. Real spirituality is about recognizing those modifications for what they are and freeing our consciousness from them. Meditation is how we experience that unconditioned state. Meditation is also the state of consciousness that allows us to understand those modifications for what they truly are. To reach the state of meditation, we need to follow the precise method. In the previous lectures, we discussed the three initial steps. The first two steps of meditation are about ethics, which remove the conditions that afflict our consciousness. Every behavior, whether physical or psychological, has consequences. Anger always produces suffering. Even when we are unaware of it within us, anger causes us to suffer. It is hidden in our mind, manipulating our perceptions. Lust always produces suffering. It modifies our perceptions and influences our mind and subsequently 
we act wrongly. Fear, pride, and envy cause suffering. Scriptures and religions have been explaining this to us for thousands of years, but we still don't get it. We still try to avoid this part of the teachings because we're afraid, because we don't want to change. We don't want to see the truth. The steps to begin meditation begin by learning to restrain behaviors that harm ourselves and others, and by learning to adopt behaviors that benefit ourselves and others. Ethics, proper behavior, changes the behaviors that cause suffering, tension. When we have good ethics, we reduce anxiety, fear, and desire. When we perform good actions, we have peace, serenity. We are no longer as influenced by anger, lust, pride, and envy. No longer mastered by our desires, and enslaved by our addictions, we start taking control of them with the aim of removing them completely. The consciousness becomes stronger. It starts to become stable, serene, free of guilt and remorse. That way, when we start to meditate, we are already calm. We are already curbing the harmful behaviors that disturb the mind, the body, and the heart. When you do what is right, you feel it, and that gives you peace, serenity, and then it's easy to relax. In the third step, we take our posture for meditation. Our posture must be completely relaxed, and our body must become absolutely still, totally motionless. In essence, we want to forget the body completely, and it will remain comfortably in its posture. If we are obsessed with a desire, that makes our mind agitated and our heart agitated and our body will be tense and agitated. That means we cannot relax on any level. In that condition, we will never be able to meditate. Remember, union is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. These modifications reside in our mind and echo in our body as tension and agitation. In the third step, we relax the body so it can become still. The fourth step of union builds on that foundation. All of the eight steps are about establishing the right conditions for meditation. The first two steps are about removing the behaviors that cause the mind, heart, and body to be disturbed, and instead adopting behaviors that promote the necessary conditions for meditation. The third step stills the body, allowing it to become relaxed so we can forget it. The fourth step stills the breath and our energy. After securing that steadiness of posture, follows regulation of breath, the control of prana, the cessation of inhalation and exhalation. Most people believe pranayama is a breathing exercise, but pranayama really is not about physical breath. It is about prana. Pranayama comes from prana, which is the life principle. It can mean breath, but it's primarily about energy, vigor, power. Ayama is restraint or control. So pranayama or pranayam is about harnessing and stilling energy. This is why the scripture says, peace of mind comes by exhalation and retention of prana. In the simplest terms, nature is prana. Prana is nature. As part of nature, we abide in prana in different modifications. Everything about us is prana in levels. 
So our consciousness is conditioned by prana in layers. To reach meditation, we need to extract the consciousness from all the layers of prana. Our body is dense prana. It breathes by means of prana. It thinks by means of prana. It takes prana to feel, to see, to hear, to walk, to dream. Everything is prana, modified in levels. Pranayam harnesses and stills all of our prana. It harnesses our prana so we can use it wisely. Pranayama literally means to harness the life force. If you've studied yoga or pranayama, you've probably heard that when practicing this type of exercise, the student visualizes bringing in energy from nature. That is the exoteric, public, superficial explanation of pranayama. Pranayama harnesses the energy that is inside of us. There is incredible energy inside of us. Consider what happens if someone takes a single atom and splits it. There is an incredible amount of energy in a single atom. So our whole being is made up of atoms in different levels, and we are therefore filled with incredible potential energy. We just don't know how to access it. But if you think about it, it's pretty obvious. Where in our lives do we find the most powerful expression of prana? If we understand that prana is the basis of life and living, then it follows that its most profound expression is in the ability to create life, our sexual power. That is why all religions taught to restrain and preserve the sexual power. Serious practitioners in every religion are required to preserve their sexual power. The public doesn't know why. In Raja Yoga, this is required in step one, brahmacharya, sexual restraint. And in step two, saucha, purity. In the first steps of Raja Yoga, the sexual power must be restrained, preserved. That is because in step four, pranayama, the preserved sexual power is utilized to still the modifications and liberate the consciousness. Pranayama transmutes the sexual power into a higher form. In Sanskrit, this higher form is called ojas, which literally means light. A light needs fuel. The fuel of the consciousness is your sexual power. Everybody wants spiritual light but nobody wants to preserve the oil that fuels the lamp. The beings who reside in the heavenly realms radiate enormous light. That is why we have the symbol of the halo and fire as divinity. They have light, vitality, vigor, power, energy. All of that is because of their sexual power. That is why, in the Yoga Sutras, it says, by the establishment of sexual continence, vigor is gained. When we are young, we have a lot of vigor. But when we reach puberty, we begin to waste it. As people get older, they waste their sexual power continually, and they weaken and decline. Subsequently, they seek everywhere for more energy, through diet, exercise, energy drinks, drugs, caffeine, vitamins, or any other way to get more energy, all the while 
they continue to waste the greatest source of energy they have, their sexual power. Eventually, they deplete their sexual power so much that they start taking pills and chemicals to stimulate it artificially. On the other hand, if you observe someone who practices real spirituality, yoga, they have bountiful energy and they are serene because they control their sexual power. We can do the same. We just need to know how. In this lecture, we will introduce this subject, but it is too vast to cover in one lecture. At glorian.org, you will find books, courses, and hundreds of lectures that explain it fully. When we preserve our sexual power and transmute it, we convert it into vigor, strength, light. And that is why in the Bhagavad Gita, Christ said through Krishna, I am the seed, virility, in you. Krishna, Christ, is the sexual power itself. Christ said through Jesus, I am the light of life. I am the ojas of prana. So this is a very sacred topic. Your sexual power is the presence of Christ. Obviously, that means your sexual power is sacred and it should be treated as sacred. The Yogshastras say, Expulsion of sexual power brings death. Preservation of sexual power gives life. The Shiv Samhita says, When the precious jewel of sexual power is mastered, anything on earth can be mastered. Through the grace of its preservation, one becomes as great as me, Shiva. Knowing this, the yogi must always preserve the sexual power. This is the ultimate yoga. Sexual power is the foundation of all religions, spirituality, meditation, and yoga. Preserving your sexual power is the basis of learning to truly meditate. Union is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. There is no greater power than sexual power. There is also no greater cause for our suffering. Humanity's suffering is rooted in lust. Therefore, real spiritual development depends upon how we deal with our sexual power and how it modifies our consciousness. As we are now, our sexual power is trapped in lust, and that is why we suffer. Swami Shivananda said, Mind, prana, and sexual power are one. By controlling the mind, you can control prana and sexual power. By controlling prana, you can control the mind and sexual power. By controlling sexual power, you can control the mind and prana. If the sexual power is controlled and if it is made to flow upwards into the brain by pure thoughts and the practice of pranayama, the mind and the prana are automatically controlled. If we want to learn meditation and experience union, we need to understand this dynamic. Mind, prana, and sexual power are one. They are not separate. If your interest is in experiencing real meditation, then you must preserve your sexual power. When you are restraining the sexual power, you must also work with prana and your mind. In other words, the preservation of sexual power is not just physical, it is psychological. If you are allowing your mind to remain addicted to lust, pornography, masturbation, looking at others lustfully, then you cannot control the prana or the sexual energy. They will all be disturbed. They are not distinct, separate from each other. 
You cannot separate psychological work from sexual work. They are completely 100% related. Even Freud knew that. Shivananda said, When a person is excited by sexual desire, the prana is set in motion. If the sexual power is lost through orgasm, prana becomes unsteady. Prana is agitated. The person becomes nervous. The mind cannot work properly. The person becomes fickle-minded. There is mental weakness. If the prana is rendered steady, the mind also becomes steady. If the sexual power is steady, the mind is also steady. Sexual power is the essence of life, thought, intelligence, and consciousness. Therefore, preserve this vital force very, very carefully. If our mind is weak, fickle, unsteady, it is because our sexual power is misdirected. That is why we need to master step four, to harness the sexual power and make it steady. Just as water can be converted into steam, and steam can power an engine, our sexual power can be converted into ojas, spiritual energy. Pranayama is how that conversion is done. Pranayama is an act of attention. In the previous lecture, you used your attention to relax each part of your body, and you experienced how effective that is. Pranayama works in a similar way on the same foundation. You focus your attention on guiding the sexual power up your spine. Usually, this is combined with the flow of breath. However, people tend to emphasize the breath and neglect the focus of attention. In reality, pranayama is mostly about attention and has little to do with physical breathing. In fact, your breath should be very quiet, subtle, even imperceptible. There are innumerable varieties of pranayama invented by Hatha yogins and do not exist in the scriptures or in the authentic meditation schools. In meditation schools, there are only a few pranayamas that are taught, and they are very simple and quiet. Pranayama is based on the previous steps of union, preserving the sexual power, relaxing the body, and making the spine straight. When the sexual power is conserved, it is a stored fuel waiting to be utilized. A relaxed body allows energy to move. A straight spine allows the energy to flow easily. Pranayama draws that power up the spine to the brain, where it nourishes the brain and the endocrine system, then the heart. You already know how the sexual power energizes your sexual organs. With pranayama, you are moving that power to stimulate your brain, your endocrine glands, and your heart. Pranayama is how we harness the sexual power and train the body so our energy flows in a healthy way and restores our psychological equilibrium. Our physical body has an energetic aspect. Our sexual power is the same. It is physical and energetic. Abusing the sexual power has damaged our body physically and energetically. When we preserve and transmute the sexual power, it can heal and restore what was damaged. Within the physical body, there are an uncountable number of channels of energy. And where those channels intersect, there are converters, transmitters. People call them chakras. The channels are how the energy flows from one place to another. 
The chakras are how the energy flows from one dimension to another. There are three channels that are significant. We have a very slender, semi-physical channel in the center of our spinal column. On either side of it are two more channels. These channels are polarized in men and women. Energy moves through these channels according to our psychological condition and the condition of our sexual power. Our psychological condition is very poor, and our sexual power is misdirected, so these channels work very poorly, if at all. With daily pranayama practice, the converted sexual power cleans these channels and invigorates them. As they are cleaned and restored, the sexual power also restores the chakras. Chakras are conduits or circuits that allow energy to move between dimensions. Your eyes do something similar. Your physical eyes transform visible light into energy that passes into your brain, where that energy is interpreted into images. The chakras do the same thing, but in other ways. They allow us to perceive non-physical images, non-physical sounds, and to recall memories of ancient times. They do not work properly in us because we have abused our sexual power and damaged our chakras, which is why we are so confused and we misperceive so much. Pranayama restores these abilities, which we can then use in meditation. Everyone wants to enter meditation and have visions, to see the spiritual worlds, to talk with divine beings. In our current state, we cannot, because our spiritual senses are atrophied, and their lenses, the chakras, are inert or obstructed. If you want spiritual sight, hearing, and memory, preserve your sexual power and harness it with pranayama. That is why step four of meditation is pranayama, because pranayama uses that preserved sexual power to still the body, heart, and mind and energize our non-physical senses. You will notice that when you preserve your sexual power and practice pranayama, your mind, heart, and body become very calm, very serene. Pranayama prepares us for step five of meditation. Anytime you prepare for meditation, practice pranayama first. If you are not retaining your sexual power, there is nothing for pranayama to harness. There are many people who waste their sexual power daily and also attempt to practice pranayama. They are like people who want to draw water from a dry well or light a lamp that has no fuel or drive a car that has no fuel in it. No matter how hard they try to start the engine, it will never start because there's no fuel in it. Your sexual power is the fuel for your consciousness. Brahmacharya is the retention of the sexual force. It is to renounce the orgasm. If you are having the orgasm, you are wasting that energy. Swami Shivananda said, when this energy is wasted once, it can never be recovered by any other means. It is the most powerful energy in the world. One orgasm shatters completely the brain and the nervous system. The energy that is wasted during one orgasm is tantamount to the energy that is spent in physical labor for 10 days or the energy that is utilized in mental work for three days. Mark how precious it is. Do not waste this energy. Preserve it with great care. You will have wonderful vitality. Pranayama works best when you are in a relaxed, motionless posture with a straight back. 
When you want water to pass through a straw or a pipe, if the straw is bent or twisted, the water will move slowly, if at all. Your spine is the straw. Your sexual power is the water. Straighten your back and neck, and the sexual power will flow easily. In addition, if you squeezed that straw tight, the water will not flow. That is what tension does. Tension is tight muscles, and it restricts the movement of energy. Therefore, your body also needs to be perfectly relaxed. We have observed people doing pranayama with a lot of tension in the physical body, straining the body, with their fists tight and their face tense, with their muscles very active and tense, breathing vigorously and loudly. Since you're preparing for meditation, pranayama should lead towards stillness and silence. Your body should be perfectly still. Your body should be motionless from deep relaxation. Pranayama should not move your body at all. Inhalation and exhalation should be silent. This is emphasized throughout the scriptures and by Swami Shivananda, who said, Draw the breath slowly, without making any noise, through both nostrils. Retain the breath as long as you can do it with comfort. Then exhale slowly through both nostrils. Do not use the nose as a suction pump. It should serve as a passive passage for both the inhaled and the exhaled air. Do not make any sound when you inhale and exhale. Remember that correct breathing is noiseless. Exhale very, very slowly without producing any noise. Pranayama is step four of preparing for meditation. The next step is pratyahara, withdrawal from the physical senses. In our pranayama, we should be withdrawing from the physical senses. Pranayama is focused on subtle energy, not the gross energy. With pranayama, you are trying to harness the most subtle energy in the body, which is the sexual energy. You cannot harness that when you are focused on physicality and the external senses. In pranayama practice, it is necessary to focus internally. Your attention should be on the energy, not the body. Leave your body behind and withdraw from your senses. Pranayama also requires a great deal of concentration. You must remain concentrated on the pranayama you are doing. If you are practicing pranayama, but you are thinking about something else, you are wasting your time. Learn to practice pranayama with complete and full attention. Do not be distracted. Mindfulness is to not forget what you are doing. It is one thing to concentrate for a moment. It is another to make that concentration continuous. That is to remain mindful, to be continually aware of what you're doing. Throughout pranayama practice, remain aware of what you are doing. Do not slip into thinking or dreaming. In a pranayama exercise, you visualize directing your sexual power from place to place. You are constantly visualizing. That visualization needs to be active and conscious with your full attention. The power of imagination is very important for the later stages of meditation. It is essential to utilize it and develop it when practicing pranayama. Prana is a living element. It is not mechanical 
automatic. Prana is the active energy of divinity. It is intelligence in nature. Prana is Shakti. It is not a force that can be fooled or toyed with. It is a living intelligence in all things. So when you are performing pranayama, you are invoking the presence of divinity. Your attitude should reflect that. Prayer is an attitude that you are doing something sacred and pranayama should be treated as such with a lot of reverence. Remember, the scriptures say, I, Christ, am the seed, the virility in you. When practicing pranayama, be aware that you are in the presence of a sacred power. You will not get results from pranayama after one session or a few days. The fruit of pranayama is like the fruit of a tree. It takes time. It has to be carefully nurtured, constantly attended to. Little by little, things change. One day, after having practiced for a long time, you will suddenly realize you have something beautiful, flowering, and fragrant that has grown inside of you, and you will be astonished. To reach that, you need persistence and patience. Our body is constantly producing sexual power, so we need to regularly transmute it. Transmutation should be practiced daily. If we are abiding by the ethical rules and practicing in accordance with the instructions given by the great masters, pranayama poses no danger or risk. There is only danger for those who do not follow the ethical rules or they modify the practices foolishly. So when properly done, pranayama can be practiced as much as one needs. Beginners can start with 10 minutes a day, and this can be increased as needed. Anytime the mind or heart or body are agitated, tense, or if the sexual power is demanding attention, then one can practice pranayama to reach stillness and calm. The only exception is for women who are on their monthly cycle. Pranayama should be suspended during menstruation so the body can complete its natural cleaning function. Pranayama is preparation for meditation. So it is always advisable to practice pranayama before meditation. Here is the simplest form of pranayama and the one recommended by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. Adopt a relaxed and attentive posture, whether seated or standing. Exhale slowly, then inhale and retain the breath. You will get a steady and calm mind. Intensely imagine solar energy rising to the brain then hold the breath. Hold the breath for as long as comfortable. Then, when exhaling the air, with your imagination and willpower, focus on the energy arriving in your heart. Remember, this must be done in a relaxed way, with full attention, without losing awareness of what you're doing. Properly done, Pranayam will deepen our relaxation and bring our body, heart, and mind to stillness and pave the way to real meditation. Practice Pranayama daily for at least 10 minutes and observe the changes that result from it.
The more consistent you are, the more quickly you will be prepared. Enter the next step.